So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another of our the art and craft of game programming. Um, it is our pleasure today to have uh, Edgar Jesus with us. He is a game designer and game artist at Space Pajamas, and he will be talking about why game design is really a discipline of design. So welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Manuel for the invite, and I would uh, beforehand to apologize if I rely on my notes a little bit, since I didn't have much time to prepare. So, okay, so in 1985, Super Mario Brothers was released for the Nintendo Entertainment Console, right? And um, during that time uh, of game development, it, it wasn't very common for games to have tutorials. Most games relied on either game manuals, which is typical from tabletop games, or uh, by simple trial and error approaches. So the player would try the game and then see how it went. Instead, in Super Mario Brothers, which something is going on here on the screen, Manuel. <laughs> That's a lot of separate. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Where was I? Okay. So instead, in uh, Super Mario Brothers, uh, players would learn the gameplay um, through the, being guided by the level design, right? And uh, the opening sections of games such as Metroid, The Legend of Zelda, and Super Mario Brothers would. Uh, basically be designed in such a way that the players would be forced to explore the mechanics instead of just coming up with hazards that they would have to deal with. So in that, and rather than confront the player with obstacles, the first level Super Mario Brothers uh, laid down a variety of in-game hazards which would be presented through repetition, iteration, and progression. Now, in an interview with Eurogamer, um, Shigeru Miyamoto, the game's creator, explained that World 1, and I'll cite, contain everything a player needs to gradually and naturally understand what they're doing so that they can quickly understand how the game works. According to Miyamoto, once the player understands the mechanics of the game, the player will be able to play more freely and it becomes their game. It's also important to note that Miyamoto was a big fan of manga and he stated that he was heavily influenced by a Japanese, Chinese and Korean structure called Kisho Tenketsu. Kishoten Kets is basically a structure that's composed by four elements. Introduction, development, twist, and conclusion. The design philosophy that was introduced in Super Mario Brothers, which he would call learning through play, has been implemented in all video games by Shigeru Miyamoto since. Now, Super Mario was also the first game that uh, was both directed and designed by Shigeru Miyamoto and was co-designed by, uh, I think it is, Takashi Tezuka, exactly. Now, Miyamoto designed the game world, and he led a team of seven programmers, artists, who turned his ideas into code, sprites, audio, and so on. So the development of Super Mario Brothers was thus one of the first cases of specialization in the video game industry. 20 years later, in 2005, a game was released called The Shadow of Colossus, which was then published by Sony Computer Entertainment for the PlayStation 2 home console. Now, this game is kind of an unusual game for an action adventure game. Basically, there are no towns or dungeons, no characters to interact with, or, and no enemies to defeat besides the Colossi. Progression through Shadow of Colossus is made in a simple fashion. There's a central point, and players will move on to in the direction of a Colossus, and each time they defeat one, they go back to the center. However, the path between the central point and the Colossus is not obvious. 
Sometimes the terrain is very varied, so the player will have to walk through it. So to help him, he has a sword, which he uses to point light with, and where it focuses, it gives him a sense of direction, a north, you can call it. Now, some people also call Shadow of Colossus a puzzle game. And that's because the Colossus themselves, the player needs to understand their behavior and use the environment around them. And each of them presents a different challenge and a different kind of puzzle. Now, regarding the actual story of the game, there's almost none to little information actually given regarding backstory of the characters or the world itself. There are some clues, however, which we can understand by sparse dialogue between two characters and visual storytelling. If anyone hasn't played it, which I find, would find weird, uh, I will not spoil and not tell the story. That's not the point here. However, Shadow of the Colossus is often regarded also as one of the few examples of games being seen as art. And uh, due to its minimalist, minimalistic sorry, landscape design, um, immer all the immersive gameplay and expression the game has, and the oversaturated lightning. The game won several awards, and today it's widely regarded as one of the greatest games of all time. Now, Guedes Games, which includes previously the released title called Eco and recently released The Last Guardian, are considered to have a very distinctive style, right? As we said, the game is often seen as a work of art, but more specifically, Guedes describes this as designed by subtraction. As I said, due to the way he actually builds his games. We'll go into that further later. Now, I've just described to you two very well-regarded, well-known games that are highly influential. A lot of people actually make games with using those games as references. So it influences both games and creators. But I would now like to tell you a story about an unknown game that was never existed, created by completely non-existent developers. So bear with me. I would like you to count me in this story. I will read. The story is as follows. John Doe, a young creator just out of XYZ University, with a degree in game development, having already some experience through the projects he worked at university and game jams he participated in, decides to go into the full development of a game to be released on the Steam platform. And it's based on an idea he has had for a while, but has never had the opportunity to implement. His idea, which is inspired by a game he respects and enjoys very much, though ambitious, is actually realistic in its production scale. As he decided to focus on a game mechanic that, from the aforementioned game, that he really liked, but he felt that was a little bit lacking on its features. Having tested, oh, yes. Having tested and thoroughly analyzed the game mechanic in question and coming up with a solution that he felt that resolved the issue and added a twist to it, um, he decides to create the prototype of the game and show it to friends and at local events for people to play test. Meanwhile, as he was developing the game mechanics, he was also coming up with the game story, along with a friend he had met at the game jam and who was now participating as an artist on the project. So after basic, uh, creating the basic narrative, doing some concept art of the environments and the characters, they made sure to write everything down on a well-structured game design document so they would always have a place to look at if they need any to consult. Now, after gathering lots of feedback from playtesting his prototype, John and his colleague go on to create several builds of the game by playtesting every version building up the game world, adding art and sound, which at this point they had commissioned, each time closer to the final builds, and always taking into account the feedback they received. So through several months of work, and having assimilated all the feedback, making several builds, polishing the game, Game Studio, as they now call themselves as a team, um, decides to put the game on green lights, and after a while, the game is approved. 
So with the last details added to the game, all the known bugs corrected, and successfully spreading the word on social networks and contacting the press, the game is published. This is it. The game is out, and now they wait patiently for the sale numbers and reviews. However, to their surprise, the game, even though it was well publicized, sales numbers are low. And the game reviews are on average either negative or disappointing. Critics, and a portion of players, praised the polished game mechanics and the pleasing aesthetics, but found themselves lost in the game at times and generally uninterested in the game as a whole. The harsher critics state that the game is all over the place. It's a patchwork of ideas, accusing it of failing to bring harmony between the content and the gameplay, leaving a sense of emptiness due to a lack of direction, both in the game world and the general concept. Now, I ask. Oh, sorry, there was a, apparently a slide. What went wrong? What is it that these creators missed during development? Did they not follow everything they had learned and all the guidelines they had learned in practice and theory about game development? They come up with a twist in the mechanics, they kept it to scale, they play tested the game and acted on given feedback, they polished the gameplay, they had nice visuals, good audio, virtually no bugs. They took all the correct steps during development and got decent exposure, and still they failed. Why was it that the game was better received, and what did the critics mean? More importantly, why was it that players, having now experienced the full game, felt that disappointed in the experience? Now, I know that I did not explain the actual gameplay of the game, nor its story or content at all. But what I did explain was how they went about creating it. I explained their process, their work process. So I ask again, what was missing in their work process? What was it that the game was lacking that the two previous games I mentioned did not? Today, I'm here to talk to you, as Manel told you, about game design. And, but more specifically, I'm here to talk to you about the design process and how we go about it. But first, what is game design? Now, Generically speaking, a game designer is responsible for the content, rules, and structure of a game, right? He's, uh, and depending on the scope, he may also be responsible for documenting the whole thing and team communication and generally guiding the vision of the game. This is the classical view of what a game designer is. However, in bigger projects, like for instance the AAA industry, there might be specializations. And those might include lead designer, world designer, content designer, systems designer, level designer, UI designer, and audio designer. Each one of them dealing with one of these, those aspects and others. Those can go from management to actual mathematical accountability behind, designing the world, actually writing the story. So that's what a world designer does, and so on. So as you can see, a game designer might, be, might do a lot of different things. And um, depending on the size and specificities of the project, it also may, it also may mean that, that there's different skill sets that the game designer might need to learn, like project management, or programming, or writing, drawing, and so on. So traditionally, when either we're starting to learn by ourselves or through a game development school um, how to be a game designer, what we, do, what we do is we deal with each trend, each approach to game design. We look at them, we learn the tools and the techniques associated with them, one at a time, and we start solving the challenges each one of them presents. However, there is one common thread that unites all of these practices, all these specializations, right? Well, and that is that they're all a discipline of design. So let's redo the question. What is design? Well, according to Wikipedia, which is always a great font of knowledge, it says, design is the creation of a plan or convention for the construction of an object, system, or measurable human interaction in that particular environment. 
that sounds all well. Um, but it doesn't really encompass the true nature of what design is. It is specific, but doesn't really say much about what it is. Hans Hoffman says that design is the intermediary between information and understanding. Whoa, this is much broader, right? This is a much broader kind of approach to what design is. If you do a quick search on the internet, there are endless quotes about what design is. So, instead, I would like to call your attention to this diagram. One side, we've got science. The other side, we've got art. In the middle, we've got design. This diagram it symbolizes a discussion, I would say a very non-amicable discussion, that's been going on for over a century about two questions. If design is a scientific or artistic practice, and if do all science and art processes have a basis in design? Well, regarding the first question, as described in the book, Design Methods, the main point of difference is that of timing. Both artists and scientists operate on the physical world as it exists in the present, while mathematicians operate on abstract relations that are independent of time. However, designers, on the other hand, are forever bound, and this is a mouthful, to treat as real which that exists, sorry, which exists only in the imagined future and have to specify ways in which the foreseen thing can be made to exist. Or more simply, as Norman Foster said, you design for the present with an awareness of the past for a future which is essentially unknown. So I understand here a basic difference with the sciences, right? And arts. So no, design is not a scientific or artistic practice. In practice and education, it's a separate culture. It's taught independently. Now, do all science and art processes have a basis in design? This one gets a little bit trickier. Regarding the second premise, the general consensus is also that no. Um, several sciences, and we can understand it, for instance, from pure classical science, you know, like mathematics, physics, chem chemistry, they don't have any kind of basis on design processes. They're purely empirical. And some, or many, defense that some forms of art also do not have any relationship with design. Now, before we proceed, I would like to address the elephant in the room, or make a little caveat. This last statement I just did, between the a separation of certain types of art and design, not only is the most debatable one, it's also, within the context of video games, related to another proposition, which is the elephant in the room, which is video games as art. So, let's look at the diagram again. So now we have science, design, video games, art. So if we say that video games are a form of art, what's this red area? The one that is not, design doesn't deal with. Well, oh, sorry. <laughs> According to uh, Marcel Duchamp, he said that there's a difference in arts, what he calls retinal art and conceptual art. Some might call retinal arts as art for art's sake. One of the best descriptions of that comes from the book The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, and he says, we can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. All art is quite useless. So this red area that we were talking about, oh, sorry, that was too fast. This red area we were talking about, let's go back. Here, that's what it's about. It's about art that's purely experimental. It's for its own sake. It's the retinal art that Duchamp speaks about and has no relationship with design. But let's go by example. Let's say you've got a client and he approaches a product designer and um, a, a, an artist, a, plastic artists, and he tells them, build me a chair, both of you, one each. So the, the, the designer, he goes on and, you know, he starts thinking what a chair is, he starts building on it, he starts, he can push the limits of where it is, 
but in the end, the function of chair is not lost, right? It still works as a chair. If the concept has been stretched or not, that's a whole other matter. However, this is what the plastic artist did. It's no longer a chair. The concept has vanished. The usefulness has disappeared. This is the main difference between the two. In design, besides the aesthetics or social, political, and cultural dimensions, which art also might deal with, we also consider functional necessities, whether subverted or not. Now, having said this, this also means that there is room in video games for this form of creation. We spoke before that art for art's sake. And don't get me wrong, I defend it. I think it is interesting to do. There have been a few examples recently, and I think it, they are important to push our, the boundaries of our medium. However, this is not what we're talking about. So whenever you hear a statement, whether one I've already done or I'll be doing from this point forward, this is not what we're talking about. Also, this is not about the idea of video games as art. Okay? So this is my caveat. So let's go back to the story of John Donne and his colleague. And let's take a look at their work process. So they start with the problem, right? He defines a problem, which is he wants to do a game, and he sees an issue on a mechanic that he finds interesting. So he identifies the needs and constraints of that issue. He uh, then researches. Remember, he play tested a lot the original game, see what might be going on. And he starts developing the solution, that twist he did on the mechanic and different thing. From there, he creates a prototype. He gives it to play test to a lot of people. And he starts going and he starts iterating on it, right? He starts improving and correcting the issues as he receives feedback. Does this remind you of something, this process? Well, of course it should, because it's basically the scientific model. It's exactly the same method. It's the method come from the scientific method. You ask a question, you research, you create an hypothesis, you test, you analyze, and then depending if you have partial or full results, you iterate. According to Oxford's Dictionary, which is a little bit more reliable than Wikipedia, the scientific method is a method or procedure consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. So let's imagine a clock, one of those old mechanical clocks. This is the prime example of the scientific method. And you want to understand this clock, how it works. So what do you do? You disassemble it in small parts, comprehensible parts. You analyze each one of them, you look at them, you see how they work, and then you put the whole thing back together. You should, by now, understand how the clock works. To this, we call having a mechanical view of the world. As René Descartes, one of the fathers of the scientific method, said, sorry, I said mechanical, I meant mechanistic. To, should have slept more. Um, as he said, I don't need the Pope to tell me how the world works. I can discover that for myself, since the world is nothing more than a machine to me basically a gangster. Um, oh, that was too fast. So as you can understand, while the scientific method is the best model for us to describe empirical evidence, the natural world, it does have some limits. And those are what we're going to talk about. So now compare that process we just saw that those developers went through and this. This looks a lot different. In fact, I imagine that none of you have ever seen this. Well, the truth is why none of you have ever seen this is though this exact model is not something that is, well, it's, as I said before, it's subject to discussion. The basic premises, the steps, even though the conventions, the names that they give might differ, this is the conventional process that people associate with the design process. Now, there are quite a few changes that aren't there. So let's see what exactly happens in practice. So John Doe and his colleague basically focus a lot on this part here. And this part here is basically, well, they did have a problem, they did define it, they went through this, but once they got here, they started iterating. 
right? And as you can see, as opposed to classical engineering process, the whole process is iterative from the start. Everything is, and they're with each other. Some stuff happens in parallel. Some others actually coincide with each other. They superpose, right? Doing this kind of approach to a process is what a lot of people call a technical kind of iteration, as opposed to a conceptual one, which is all that area in red there. Now, to understand the importance of um, iterating on every aspect of our design, we must first understand the underlying issue here. What's actually beneath all of this? What's actually the big difference between the two processes and why they differ so much? And that has to do with that small part there. You see, the issue is the nature of the problem. While empirical models, more specifically the scientific method, which then translates into engineer, engineering design process, deals with problems that look about, deal with the how, how something works, design approaches worries about the what and the why also. So the nature of the problem is completely different. This is what we sometimes called as wicked problems. So let's go on to another little experiment or exercise. Let's say you're an architect and a client approaches you and he basically asks you to build him a house. The first thing a student of architecture learns in his first year of studying is to question what is a house. Well, this might seem actually ridiculous or nonsensical. The truth is, what is the client actually asking? He asks him to build a house. Okay, that's fine and dandy. But what, he's just going to use a standard plan that simply adapts to the terrain he's in and to the budget, so forth? No, he has to understand what the client wants. So when he's asking what is a house, he's thinking, is it the first house? Is it the second house? If it's a second house, is it for vacations? Is it for work? Is it just for his retirement? What does the client feel a house is? What's this concept of home, which is different from house? And so on. So what suddenly has importance? As you can see from this basic example, which is a very classical exercise, by the way, um, it, it tries to deal with what we call ill-defined problems, the wicked problems we spoke about earlier. And it, it's, it starts from the onset as trying to work through things conceptually instead of simply technically. Now, when this principle of questioning the what and why uh, is ignored, the result is a, a kind of design culture and practice that Christopher Alexander, in a book called Notes on the Synthesis of Form, calls unselfconscious design. As ne Catherine Neal in How We Design Games and Why says, the design rules and solutions are largely unwritten and are learned informally. The same form is made over and over again with no need to question why. Designers lead only learn the patterns. They know that a specific design element is good, but they do not need to understand why it is good. Or as Daniel Cook said in 2007 on this uh, Gamma Sutra article, we currently build games through habit, guesswork, and slavish devotion to pre-existing form. This is not good. Now, there's also another difference in this model that you might have noticed. That's that little area there that has the word ideate. What is that? Well, that portion of this concept of, sorry, of this process is a process into itself. <laughs> And it's, in fact, it's one of the most essential parts of the process. It defines a part of the process that deals with what Christopher Alexander refers to as self-conscious design. And basically, the designer engages in a private conversation between the materials he's using, so his elements, his principle, his configurations, and that he's trying to manipulate and create in himself. Basically, again, as Catherine says, a way to solve problems without relying on making. 
So what is this, ideation? Well, ideation is a creative process of generating, developing, and communicating new ideas, where an idea is understood as a basic element of thought that can be either visual, concrete, or abstract. So, as described in this phase, the designer comes up with ideas and how to start developing them. And to do this, it is essential that he finds a means of communication. Something that he can use, whether visual language, symbols, or metaphors, so he can think his idea is true, have that conversation. But we'll speak a little bit more about that later. For now, look at this following diagram. This is a zoom of that purple area I showed earlier. Now, as you can see, we have a starting point. And from that starting point, we can have conceptual, experimental, and formal ideas, right? And um, while the names are self-explanatory, I like, again, to go through an example. So let's say you're in a game jam, and the team is top-down stealth, and you have a team of three programmers, uh, sorry, three members, a programmer, an audio designer, and an artist. The first two decide to go into a brainstorm session. So they decide that they'll take turns, four rounds each, and they'll just say the first thing that comes to mind. And this is what they come up with. Hidden, darkness, isometric, espionage, noise or silence, fear, low poly, treason, treason and betrayal. Meanwhile, the third member, he decides to simply open up his sketchbook and start drawing. He starts drawing without instinctively, he doesn't even think, he just draws environments, characters, diagrams, symbols, even phrases, he writes off stuff whatever comes to mind without any restraint or order. Now, what the first two members are doing is kind of more this mental approach, right? They're uh, basically using whatever comes with their ads or using an abstract approach, trying to understand um, what that team makes them think about, right? Now, What's important also to understand here is from a high-level uh, thinking approach or a high-level work approach, the next thing they need to do is understand them. Those words that they're doing, what do they mean conceptually? And basically, they have to understand two differences. What's a formal idea and what's a conceptual one? So let's look again at those that brainstorm. The ones in orange, at least it looks like orange, um, or what we call conceptual ideas. The ones in green are what we call formal ideas. So, oh, sorry. And the second, did I put that here? Oh, I didn't apparently. Okay, so formal ideas refer to anything that has to do with visual or auditory aesthetics. While conceptual ideas refer to anything that's related to actions, meaning beliefs or feelings. Or in other words, you can define formal ideas as being sensorial, while the other ones as being either intellectual, emotional, or motorial in function. The third member of the team was being more experimental. He wasn't really thinking in formal or conceptual ways. Well, it's true that the result of what he was drawing was aesthetic, but that doesn't mean that's what he was bringing out of it. He was just doing things. He was thinking by doing. He could as well just open up his favorite game engine, let's say Unity, and decide to put two blocks and put some physics in it and see what came up with without even thinking what he's doing. And that would start getting his juices flowing. So let's look again to the diagram. You start from any one of them. It doesn't matter. But two things that are important to understand. The first one is that whether you start formally, whether you start from a conceptual point of view, or whether you're just trying stuff out, you'll have to go through all three of them. This means that if you come up with a formal idea, you have to experiment with it, and you have to understand why, or more appropriately, what you're doing. And that's the conceptual part. You know, what am I doing? I'm, I'm drawing something here, or I'm thinking formally, I have these images in my head, but what, what is the concept behind it? And how would I do it? And you start experimenting. The second point is, as most common than not, we'll start understanding that 
some designers or some people, let's just say people, we generally have a tendency to have a, one of those three approaches. This is obviously not, obviously not uh, an absolute truth, but we'll start discovering that more, more often than not, we have a tendency to start from one of these three points. And then what happens is we get stuck in them. You know? um, formal thinkers will have a tendency to always think in a formal way. Conceptual ones never do anything. Now, while I am commenting on the tendencies to prefer a certain starting point, as I was saying again, the important part is that you really have to go through all the three processes. You have to basically understand each one of them, be able to identify them, and then see how they relate to each other. I'm going completely off script. <laughs> now, however, the way you do that and what's the point of doing that is the part that's missing. This diagram is incomplete. I took off a piece of it. And that's about how we work as designers practically and where we're directing our attention to. So there's a, a term that's called gestalt and in psychology this concept is where basically uh, theorists found that there's a propensity in humans to conceptually group things together to make a meaningful whole. We call that gestalt. You might know this phrase, but not the correct one. So the correct phrase is, the whole is other than the sum of the parts, which is most commonly said as, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This is actually wrong and completely misses the point. The point is that when you start intersecting, those experimental, formal, and conceptual ideas, and all of the appreciation and everything they're putting into a project, you're supposed to come up with something new. So just like we said before that it's a conversation between designer and his work, just like in a real conversation, if you have two people or three or four talking with each other, the point is to reach a consensus and bring out new ideas, something new, unless no one can agree upon and they just each go their way and nothing happens and, <laughs> and that's politics. So looking at the part that's missing, the whole point of doing this is so you arrive as what is actually most commonly known as a design concept. Now, we spoke about the tools, how we do this. And as I said, I'm completely off script at this point, sorry. Okay, so basically to help clarify uh, how we, we do this, so the way we communicate ideas, as I said before, is through visual language, symbols or metaphors. And the whole overall perception of Gestalt is that design is created through certain principles like harmony, unity, balance, proportion, and so forth. And designers can use those principles to create visual connections and relationships between their ideas so they can get an overall feel. But let's go into the example. This is an example that's mostly used in architecture and level design. And basically, it's called a party. And what is a party? Well, a party can be expressed several ways, but it's most often expressed by a diagram uh, depicting the general floor plan, organizing, or, uh, which organizes a space, and by implication, its experience and aesthetic sensibility. It's kind of simple to understand, but Matthew, Frederick, goes on and he says, at its most ambitious, a party derives matters more transcendent than mere architecture. This is true also for game design. So looking again at those examples that he drew, we can say that, for instance, in this example, the uh, missing spoke, let's call it, we can say that in loss, there is opportunity. Suddenly, there's a message there. And that finger poking into the woods, it might be a conversation about ecology, the relationship with land and forests. And he expresses that in a diagram. That's what he meant with expressing a matter that's more transcendent than what you're talking about, than simply the formal part. So, in other words, or more simple ones, a design concept is nothing more than a phrase or paragraph, a drawing or a diagram, 
that symbolizes what our project is about. It works as the heart core of our game that translates what we mean to accomplish. And that works as a reference for, that points all the decisions regarding our design. Yeah. Now, one of the most typical issues um, that emerge out of games that don't have a design concept behind them is what we call uh, feature creep. Now, most people actually think that feature creep is about a game that has too many features. It's not. Feature creep is when a game has features that don't relate with each other. So that means that, for instance, you have secondary mechanics that don't relate to your main mechanics or other mechanics in the game at all. They're just there, glued on top. The same can be said for the story or any other feature of the game, the audio. That's feature creep. Another typical thing that happens is what happened to John Doe and his friends, which is a complete lack of purpose. The uh, fact that people will get lost or won't understand what they're supposed to do. Now, by opposition, in both Super Mario Brothers and in Shadow of Colossus, both games had a very simple and well-defined design structure. Underlying it, a design concept. And this made clear for the player the purpose and provided a sense of direction. The course structure also provided players with the means for exploring and discovering the game rules and mechanics and to deal with any obstacles that they might encounter. And from the designer's perspective, it helped them to create experiences that were coherent, that were correctly translated and unified their ideas, and it guided them while implementing them. As Petrula von Trix says, Patrick safe, uh, pa practice safe design, use a concept. However, having a, a design concept um, that informs our design decisions does not mean following an approach that sees complexity as an opponent to, ele uh, opponent to elegance, where only minimal components or features are accepted. This has no relationship one to another. That kind of approach belongs to something else that's called a design philosophy, or in this case, to a specific one. So, so far, we've discussed the design process. We've um, talked about concepts like gestalt, RT, ideation, iteration, playtesting, and so on. And if we would have delved even deeper, we could have gone into the elements, principles, and configurations that designers use, those tools, those materials we spoke about. And if we even went into the exact terminology that we use in game development, we would talk about stuff like verbs, mechanics, objects, scenes, spacing, flow, and so on and so on, which are the terminology that most of us actually learn one way or another, which apparently a lot of us don't agree upon. If we continue to work on top of this, if we continue to work on our vocabulary, on the premises to which upon to build a work structure, well, we would have created what we call a framework. Now, there's an issue here. First of all, a framework is a real or conceptual structure intended to serve as a support or guide for the building of something that extends upon the structure into something useful. Basically, what we said before. But unfortunately, in game design culture, which is really the most criticism I'm going to do here, Many designers and developers have a natural fear of establishing game design frameworks. And this is out of a belief that they might either limit them or that it's impossible. This, is, this couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, this is actually ridiculous. Every discipline of design in every other area started that way by simply brute forcing or doing that unguided, unselfconscious design approach that we spoke earlier about. But eventually, years pass, you go through phases, you reach milestones, you start reaching consensus between um, terminology and other things like that, and frameworks start to show up. The fact that some fear that it might limit us is a complete lack of understanding of what the framework is and how to use it. The truth is, 
if I use a certain framework, so let's say we had done this exercise that would need like a full class or full semester for that, but let's say we've, we had created here a framework to work on. So we would agree upon certain terminology, we, the process would be further developed, we would go into the principles that we would be guiding ourselves through. That doesn't mean that everyone needs to use that exact framework. Using common terminology is useful, however, but everything else, that's something that we can actually try upon. In fact, I would say that people should try different frameworks of dealing with it. Other disciplines of design have different frameworks. They don't have one for everyone. So the, the idea that might limit this is actually the opposite. Because when you go through this kind of unguided brute force approach, what happens is because you don't have anywhere to put your feet on, you're lost. You're trying stuff out with no direction. When you give someone the direction, suddenly they're free. They know where they're going, they know what they can use, and so they can try a bunch of different things. Now, if having a framework helps you by having an underlying structure to build upon your work, a design philosophy purpose is to express what one believes design should accomplish. So it's basically a way of expressing exactly what we think the purpose of design is and what its role in the process of completing a project. It's the why to our process. It's why we do it in a certain way according to certain beliefs. So it's like a step further from a framework. Let's look at Shigeru Miyamoto and Fumito Ueda. This is the other characteristic. So both of them have certain beliefs on the result of what the game should be. So Shigeru Miyamoto, which in the meantime has extended to the whole Nintendo philosophy, they, think, they see play at the core of the experience and the purpose is to create fun. While Fumito Ueda is a design that believes game as a form of art, which means there are no actual limits to it non-specific kind of emotion to express. Their own design philosophies as defined by themselves, as we saw earlier, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto's is learning by, through playing, while Fumito Ueda used this design by subtraction that he calls. Now, learning through play actually is based upon a principle that's called form follows function. What I did not mention earlier is that Shigeru Miyamoto is, is a graduate of industrial design. That's what he studied. And then he went to Nintendo, and he was one of the first people to work at Nintendo that wasn't a programmer or something like that. So he probably brought that from him, because this is a very typical thing in both product design and industrial design. On the other side, Fumito Ueda, which initially was an artist, um, has this more less is more approach, which is basically what design by subtraction means which is also a very common expression used by, for instance, sculptures. If you ever heard that expression, I didn't sculpt that, I just took off what was extra on it, right? I had the block and I just took off what wasn't there. That's designed by subtraction, that philosophy, working with the emptiness, the empty side of it. And both of them relate to a bigger design philosophy and they are functionalism and minimalism. Now, minimalism is actually a, related to functionalism in a lot of sense. They are very related. But the point where both of them actually encounter each other is how they believe you should approach game development. And that's that ideas for game mechanics should be made first and then you should complement by a game story. It's obviously not an absolute, it's just what they believe in. That's their belief in the result, this is their belief about the process. How they go about it. Now, even though I'm saying that they both had different backgrounds, one in art and the other one in, in industrial design, that doesn't mean that everyone that's a game designer needs to have that, obviously. They're just two iconic uh, uh, game developers that happen to have that background. But what's important to learn is that whatever the background you get into, everything we spoke of here is something you should really learn to understand if you want to be a designer. Now, these are two examples of design philosophies. There are many, many more. Curiously, not in video games. There aren't much. Most video games, for instance, follow this to the letter, this idea. 
that form false function. If you jump and you see an enemy, if he has spikes on his back, well, that means it'll hurt you. That's form false function. You decide everything in a way that informs the function by the way it looks. This is not an absolute. There could be a project where you decide that maybe I'm going to subvert that. But it needs to have a concept. It needs to explain why it's doing that. So you would have to have a certain belief and you have to understand what you're doing. In arts and design in general, there are endless, a lot of different design philosophies to build upon, to research. And I would actually advise that anyone that wants to try different things would you know, look through a little bit and see what kind of design philosophies they can encounter that might interest them. Don't try one, try many. Now, there is something that's common to happen, and that's why maybe why both of them are like this. This is set in stone for them. Not everyone has to be like that. Not everyone has to follow the design philosophy for all eternity. That's me, this is who I am. But it is a natural phenomenon. It doesn't happen to everyone, but it does happen to a lot of people. As you grow and as you experiment more and more with different principles, you start discovering new things, you start identifying with them, and eventually start building a belief system. I'd like to leave you with the final quote and remark. There are things known and there are things unknown, and in between them are the doors of perception. Aldous Huxley, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Our area, video games, still has everything to explore. There's still a lot of unexplored terrain there, out there. And anyone in this room could be a pioneer. That's not very common. Not for most mediums. The only way you're going to do that is if you question things. So question them. Thank you. So thanks a lot. So thanks a lot, Edgar. That was refreshing and interesting. So I would ask if anybody has questions for Edgar, I will pass the mic. Um, you spoke about uh, functionality uh, in design and uh, about retinal art and uh, and uh, I forget the, the name you used, the other kind of more functional uh, art. Mm -hmm. um, how would you, I know this, this isn't about games being art or, or not, but mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned functionality mm -hmm. specific, uh, specifically in design. How would you uh, approach how do you explain that functionality in video games, is my question. Well, video games have a purpose of them. The function here is, first of all, it has to be a playable. So right uh, from the start, sure, that's sure, a sure. function. My question was more about, uh, isn't that function already inherent uh, of the uh, platform, would you say, itself, of the product itself? Well, yes and no. If you try any of those, for instance, games, this is a good question because it's true. Some people could defend that it's impossible to do this kind of retinal pure art uh, in video games. But the point is that if you do a game where it's not obvious what you're supposed to do, where there is no coherence in terms of what you expect, in terms of function, what the game is supposed to be, then no. You're talking about functionality in the sense that I can use it, but at the same time, I can grab that chair and put it somewhere else, but use it as a chair, that's different, right? That's what I mean with the difference there. The fact is, if you do a video game with no function, what would that look like? Ask his, right? Yeah, examples. Things that when you look at them, more of an ex the the expression side completely overcomes the functional side more of it. Of an experience than yes, rather a game. it becomes something that's, for instance, most commonly, completely open to interpretation. I don't know a single piece of conceptual art, uh, sorry, of retinal art, most of it that isn't like that. In fact, some conceptual art also is like that. But normally, you can come to terms with what it is. A good example, for instance, in movies is: Have you ever seen a movie like uh, Mulholland Drive or uh, Lost Highway? Sure, sure. You know, as movies, 
David Lynch. Well, David Lynch does this kind of what maybe you could indicate as being retinal art. Well, that's not actually true. It's completely conceptual art. But he does it in such an obfuscated way that it's like a puzzle. When you watch the movie, you're trying to understand what is going on, but there are clues. You can do something. There is a function still in it. You can still understand the premise of the movie if, if you watch it a hundred times, but you can. On the other hand, do you know a movie called Shandalu? Shandalu was a short movie done by Salvador Dali and a few other people. Yes, exactly, thank you. And if you watch that movie, there's no functionality in it. It's a complete expression of surrealism in movies. You just watch it and you enjoy the experience. So it's the same thing. It's the equivalent is that. So you can see a narrative, the other one you can, for instance. Anyone else? Are you all shy question. or just have no questions to do? I whatsoever? have a question for you. Yeah. Where are the frameworks? Are there any, any frameworks? In video games? In game design? Yeah, yeah at, no. at this point. Well, there were a few um, people that tried. Ralph Koster, um, a few others, Ian Bogost. They still do, a lot of them. There was a peak in 2006, 2005, around that time where a lot of people start really getting bothered about this issue. So if you look at Gamma Sutra from that time or other sites, you'll see a lot of that showing up in the books that we're reading, the theory of fun and so forth. For instance, um, um, Anna Entropy wrote that book that's called Game Design Vocabulary. Actually, it isn't really a vocabulary. She goes through some of the vocabulary. It's mostly a framework. In fact, she does certain assertions there, what she believes to be, this is how you should do games. She's, she's doing a framework. She's saying, this is how you should do it, this is the process. So that's a trying, uh, that book tries to build upon a framework. It doesn't go really into it, it doesn't declare it, but it's mostly trying to do that. But then there was some kind of fallout. You see, um, what drives a lot of the industry, obviously, is money, and it's a AAA industry. And from their side, as what happened is the technology also progressed. And as the technology started progressing, it started getting easier and easier to iterate. So if you read that article we spoke about, it's that example of the wheel, right? Well, in the old days, you had like a creator of wheels and he would grab a wheel and as he learned from his father and his father learned from his father and so forth. And he would grab the wheel and he was taught how to do it, so he does it. So the iteration of that is very long. It's from generations, right? It changes slowly until that point that guy said in the book where you start wondering, why is it like this? I have no idea why is it, it's like this. I'm just doing what my father did. And he searched and searched, he couldn't find anything, right? What's happening in video games is we're doing that iteration on the wheel really fast, right? Anyone here actually can do it fast. Imagine AAA. Basically, you can grab a prototype, put it, test it, view, and you very fast are iterating, right? So you can like go through 100 cycles of your design thing but it's a completely brute force approach. It's like saying you want to crack a password that has like 20 numbers, alphanumeric, with caps lock and whatever, in the middle, and you're going to brute force it. It's going to take like three years to do it, right? It doesn't make any sense. You don't brute force that. Use a log logarithmic formula. Use a mathematical equation to understand what's going on there so you can do it faster. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of analogy to what's happening here. So if there are frameworks, some people try it. Not completely, but some people try it. And what do you actually do in your work? Do you follow something, some kind of? Well, uh, as anyone else, I'm uh, building upon my own framework, obviously. Um, well, apparently, obviously, because I gave this talk. Um, but yes, I use a basic framework, which I'm actually on the work of trying to write it down, everything, and maybe publish one day. Yeah, yeah, that's but that takes a long time. <laughs> but yes, I do work on a, some premises, but uh, it's like any other thing. As I was saying earlier, I try stuff out too. Some stuff I don't. I tried it, and as time passed by, I started saying, eh, maybe I agree with this. Why not? A good example is uh, I imagine that most of people here have re read one of the most famous game design books that exists, The Book of Lenses, right? The Art of Game Design. If you don't notice, it doesn't ever mention that. But that guy works based on the framework. 
If you read the beginning of the book, he starts explaining what he sees as being a game, right? And in fact, he uses a lot of terminology along the, the book, which some of them he never explains. He just uses them, like game mechanic, which is too easy to people to use, where in fact, most game designers don't agree what exactly it means. But going back to the point, in the book of lenses, he uses a very specific mindset. And his mindset, for instance, for games is definition, which is the building block of what your framework is going to be, as you start by a definition like Miyamoto and Shigeru do of what the game is for them, more specifically what the video game is, which is the point here, which is different, is the first thing he does is that exercise, what is a game? And you, you'll start to understand that his point of view is completely from a point of view of not of me to wed us, it's more like Nintendo's one, is a game is a game, like a board game is. There's rules, there's winning conditions, there's losing conditions. Things that, when compared to something like Journey or other big name projects, have no relation to, right? Because there's no winning, losing conditions, there's no typical, but that book is completely on that basis. So for instance, a young designer starts reading the book and doesn't understand that he's working on that premise because he never says he is, he just defines it as, and it's more kind of implicitly doing. That means that there's a lot of stuff there that you're learning that's always just based on that premise, right? And he was also a designer of roller coaster rides in Disney, so that really explains it. If you want to see roller coasters, it's just open Uncharted or any of the Uncharted games. They're completely roller coaster design. I think that kind of answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> a big answer, maybe. Yeah. Any questions? Do you consider yourself to have uh, a single philosophy for developing games? Uh, the framework is more like almost your modus your operandi. Yes. More or less. But like the philosophy, which is like... Uh, your what purpose, you believe in. Yeah. Do you, do you have your well-defined philosophy? Like uh, uh, Miyamoto is, um, as you said, the form follows function. Mm -hmm. or that. And for me to wear the, the design by subtraction, less is more. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that you are working, uh, being guided by this uh, philosophy, which you think it's important, or are you just, well, yeah, it's just more curiosity. <laughs> when uh, I was more related to architecture, 10 years ago, I don't know how long now, I, I did develop more of a philosophy, because having a, a design philosophy is a little bit like saying, what's your identity? What do you identify with, right? There's no right or wrong. You know, there, there would be a lot of discussions, in the, especially in the beginning of the 20th century, about, you know, who was right. You know, one guy would show up and says, less is more, and then someone says, and says, less is a bore, right? And the arts and crafts movement is completely against less is more. They say, you know, that's what made these really bleak buildings exist, right? That came from the modern movement. So when you ask me if I have a design philosophy, in terms of video games, I'm discovering that there is space for new kinds of philosophy, design philosophies. But I do have some bases in a few of them that generally guide me in my belief system. One of them is really a design philosophy that's most present in an architect called Ram Kulas. He's the guy that designed uh, Casa da Musica uh, uh, at Porto and a bunch of other stuff. And he's, well, that's just because I started identifying me. Remember earlier I said you start understanding what kind of approach you have a tendency to have for things. I'm a conceptual guy. When you ask me an idea, I'll have a lot easier. When I was doing that brainstorm, the ideas there, everything almost that came to mind was conceptual. Like the formal things was like, oh, then I went like low poly. Yeah, why didn't I remember that? It's something completely formal. Um, so it's not a coincidence that conceptual frameworks for design, there are design philosophies that's called conceptual design um, or something I identify with but I do think they go a little bit too far. So, um, kinda? The answer is kinda? kinda so, answers, um, yes. it's, it's, I used bases on a few design faults that are pre-existing, and now I'm kind of, as I do video games, you know, I'm still, everyone here is new to video games. None of us has like 20 years career or 10 years career. Not like these guys, right? So, um, it's, Maybe one day I'll have like one specific design philosophy. What I do right now is I experiment a little bit with different philosophies, but I do experiment with different philosophies. Yeah, yeah. I almost never do a game without having an idea of what I believe in for that project. 
just recently for our project, I had a, a humongous debate uh, between ourselves because they want to do something, which doesn't matter to say here what it was, with the game, and I was against it because I thought it was completely against the whole principle of how the game was built. But philosophies can also extend to very small detail things. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're going to launch a game for mobile, iOS, Android, and so on. Do you believe, and I'm using this word, believe that uh, freemium is a good model? Do you like free-to-play games? That's an interpretation that a lot of people say that pay to win, right? Do you like them? Is it something you would do? Uh, if I think as uh, my goal is to make a good game as a product, I mean a good product, or a thing that's... Forget what you're thinking, what you're... I'm not talking about working for a client. I'm talking about you. You're doing it for yourself. Would you do that? Like me personally? Yes. I wouldn't do it. Okay, so that's already a belief there. That's something you believe in. Look. Those games are based on a, a simple structure that's called a compulsion loop. It's nothing more than a game loop, but it, it compulses you, okay? It comes from casinos and from other places. It comes from Skinner boxes and all those kinds of things, right? You have to be a good designer to do that. Don't misinterpret. A, a very good designer, you, you have to be good at that. You have to all really understand the psychology behind it, yeah, the yeah. systems, and everything. But it's completely different to ask, is it something you believe in? Is it something you want to do? A lot of people say that's fine, and I'm fine with that. But if you would ask me about that, yeah, I don't do that. Part of the, the discussion within our team was that. They basically want me to build in a compulsion loop in the game, even though they didn't know that was what they were asking. And I said, no, I don't design compulsion loops. It's not a matter I think they're wrong, it's just I don't believe in them. It doesn't mean you can't believe in them. There it is. So that's like, for instance, one simple, specific of a point of maybe that kind of direct you your type of design philosophy. You know, I'm more close to Fumito Ueda there. Uh, I just asked this because out of curiosity, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I felt like when I started to develop, uh, to, to do game design without mm -hmm. actually no, thinking that, okay, I'm doing game design and I'm following this, it was like more experimenting things. And, mm -hmm. and I n naturally found that I was metro ma materializing, like materializing, I don't know. Okay, yeah. um, something, some ideas or with some purposes that I really believe are important mm -hmm. because of other games I also played, which uh, had a, like an impact? A, an impact in me, like, mm -hmm. a, and I, and I thought, wow, this is really good. And why is, why this is good? And I, I search for the designers, more about the designers, more about their goals. I watch a lot of things and a lot of in, a lot of videos, interviews, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, talks. And I was looking to these designers I really liked. And uh, as I heard them speaking to why they they do game design and why they do the games they do, what's their purpose? Like that stuff. Uh, was stuck with got you. stuck in my head, yeah. yeah. And naturally, like maybe one or two years later, I was just experimenting things and following the same, more or less the same philosophy. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I think, finding out what's my philosophy. But it was, it was not like I know what my philosophy is, and I'm starting to yeah. build a game yeah, based yeah, yeah, on yeah. this. It well, like, it normally happens like that. Yeah. But so, um, I will mention one thing though. It's good to find someone that you can follow their philosophy with. I mentioned Chaim Kulas, guys outside of video games, and for me to add inside of video games. Um, but it is important to, little by little, find your, yeah. okay? What I mean with that is, I didn't bring those two guys by coincidence. Besides the fact that they're like a classical example, you know, first image of the presentation is Super Mario Brothers. Like, okay, of course, again, designer is going to bring up Super Mario Brothers. But why is that that it happens? Because we're still stuck to it. The same thing with when Shell of Colossus showed up, the same started happening with it. Everyone talks about that game. And then suddenly everyone look, look, Iku, that no one paid attention at the time. And the guy was doing the same thing, right? And suddenly you get a bunch of people that use the same kind of philosophy, right? And what happens is if you actually look at the game development world, the top of my head, 
How many game designers do you know that actually have a design philosophy? Besides those two that I mentioned. Maybe Can you remember anyone? Not going to help you. I think John Blow has a philosophy. Mm, John Blow, maybe, yeah, yeah, good one. An indie guy. Yeah. In indie, you find a little bit of this. Yeah, in indie, you find a lot of examples. Definitely. But outside of indie? Mm. That's it. Yeah. Mostly know. it. I don't know. And that's why everyone talks about them always. It's the same thing with how they structure their games. You know that diagram I showed of Shadow of Colossus? Uh, I didn't do that because I didn't have time, but I could have done the, like, a diagram of Super Mario Brothers also. It's a very easy one to do, right? Everyone knows this. The three-step kind of design. With the, it's like the Kisho Tenket uh, thing I told you about, right? So the Super Mario 3D World uses that to uh, an exaggeration to a point, right? Actually, it's a very, very, very good game, but it uses that, obviously, right? How many people use that? How many people use the other one? So it's interesting to find different designers and be inspired by them. But what happens is we're using the same brute force iteration approach to what they do. Yeah. It's like, OK, so I'm doing this. I don't know where I'm going. Some, some guy comes up with and he says, OK, now I'm going to use your thing and brute force it also into something different. It's like. Stepping stones show up, but then every time there's a stepping stone, everyone goes into that stone. Like, okay, we'll stay here in this one, and then everyone goes into the other one, and everyone's iterating on that. Yeah. You yeah. get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, as experience comes in, and as you you yourself start developing games and starting doing different things with them, it's important. To sometimes, what I'm saying is, get out of your comfort zone. Try something you would never do. That's what I'm doing with this stupid game I'm doing. It's like completely out of my comfort zone. So much I understood that's not what I want to do at all. <laughs> but you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? No, I don't know what time is it. Maybe it's too late already. Yeah. What time is it? So I think Damn. we'll close the session. Yep. And I thank Edgar for coming. Thanks. And thank invite. you all for coming. And a uh, round of applause for our speaker today. Thank you.